Were you wearing your hat when you drove in? Because I felt like I saw a silhouette of you in your hat when you came to the gate. Were you wearing the hat wearing in the car? It? I think I was wearing it, yeah. Yeah, it's a pretty uh, intimidating silhouette. Because you weren't driving, if I'm right, right? No. And I saw you drive through because I uh, beeped the gate open. And I was like, ah, oh, there she is. It could have been Beyonce. You know, it could have been. <laughs> but you have what I can pull off at times, too, is I have such a signature, like, extra part of me, which is my glasses. Mm-hmm. That if I take them off, even if I put on clear ones, I've had people not know who I am. Oh, fully, yeah. It's I can I can walk through the crowd that I just played a show in front of, and take the hat off and some of the makeup off and just put uh, shorts and a t-shirt and walk right into the audience at a festival I just played literally half an hour <laughs> before, and nobody even looks at me. It is such a part of your performance identity. The same way my glasses are trademark. Yeah, where people. Just know me because of it. Do you ever regret? Because I, I like that I can peel them off and and I can have a little bit of anonymity. Mm-hmm. Do you ever regret people and wearing the cowboy hat or or no? I don't. I, I feel like especially at a time when no women were wearing them at all. Mm-hmm. It was all the guys wearing them. Um, it set me apart and it gave me a brand and like I just said, a trademark that nobody else had and it. You know, it, it's it's something that I'm from Alberta, Canada. You know, it's the prairies of Canada is very country, sure. it's very ranchy. It's very, uh, you know, I grew up wearing hats, you know, singing around my hometown and stuff. So, and then when I moved to Nashville, I sold Western apparel up in Hendersonville at a Western store for a while. So it, it, it all felt like a very natural thing for me. And musically, you know, what I've done musically, it all, it all fit together. But I, I do feel like, it does. Reba told me one time, she, smartest thing you ever did, you don't have to do your hair. Yeah. You know, she's just like, <laughs> wish I'd have done that. But yeah, no, it it does, it kind of, it, it's a very, it does pigeonhole, honestly, to me, now that everybody's wearing these Western hats with whatever goes from the neck down. Sure. But I always felt like, you know, the, that the upstairs had to, you know, match the downstairs a little bit. So it kind of limited also what I felt I could wear, you know, for the rest of, of the stuff. But it does... It sets me apart, and I'm grateful for it. In fact, so much so that I think there have been people that actually don't know my name. But if somebody says, oh, she's the girl that wears the cowboy hat. Oh, that's who sings that song. Oh, it's for sure. I mean, yeah. I, I know you're still, I could identify you by your silhouette, which is a compliment. Thank you. And that yeah. it is like the, the terror, it's just, you were in, my, in the driveway, and you are in your hat. It was just, <laughs> And I just saw your shadow, and I was like, holy crap, there she is coming through. Anyway, that was that was just me. That's not even a real thing. Well, thank you. We'll that's, keep that's this a in. Compliment. Thank but you. Um, did you do the typical Nashville, get in the car and drive down and move down, like from <laughs> Alberta? Did you pack up a car? or it, Yeah. How far is that drive? Um, well, from, from Alberta to Nashville is probably in the 2,000-plus mile range, but... I had uh, I had gone to live with my grandparents in Ontario for about six months before I moved to Nashville. Long story there, but I ended up, my mom flew from Alberta to Ontario, and her and her one of her very best friends, who had known me since I was a little baby, uh, basically, they we all decided it was just time for me to go to Nashville. I had been waiting on a legal way to move here. <laughs> I didn't I, have I a know, green card. I, I know have, a lot of people didn't wait for that part of it. They just they did it the, it, yeah. the, the non-super legal way. Well, I did the I did it the non-super legal way, and and we just said, you know what? I was 18 years old, and I was getting depressed because this was my destiny, and I had to be here. And so uh, moved in a Honda Civic with a guitar in the back seat and everything I owned. And man, the days of life being so simple that everything you own can fit in the back seat of a car. Sometimes I miss that that simplicity in life. But we crossed the border, the border agent's looking in the back seat. He sees these two women with this teenager in the back, and he's like, uh, where are you ladies headed? Who was with you? Uh, my mom, Linda, and her friend Pat. Pat was driving. Pat's a solid friend then. She's solid until we found out she had pot in the car after we got across the border. You but know that's what? That's a whole other story. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Could have derailed the whole thing. I don't think I've told anybody that yet, but I don't think Pat would care. It's legal in Canada now. Anyway, so uh, so we crossed the border, and the border agents look in the back seat at the guitar, and and we're thinking we're thinking we're going to be in trouble because we know we're we have no intention of actually bringing me back to Canada. We're just leaving me there. 
Uh, and but you goes, don't say that, right? You just, no, you just no, we're going that. shopping. Totally shopping, just for with couple, your guitar. Totally, just, just to yeah. play songs while you shopping, buy turtlenecks. Going yeah. to, well, he said, "Where are you going?" And so Pat's like, "The Grand Ole Opry. We're gonna go see the Grand Ole Opry." So they they thought that these three broads are on the way to Nashville to do the Nashville touristy thing with the guitar, <laughs> and um, they, they didn't. He didn't know that they, there were only two coming back. So when you're moving down, is it you're you're such a teenager, right? You're 18 mm-hmm. or 19 years old, and where did you learn about Nashville? Was oh. it the Opry? But for me, I live closer. I'm from Arkansas. So yeah. it wasn't that Nashville was thousands of miles away or 500 miles, depending on where you're coming from. Um, it was the state next door, but I really learned about it through watching TNN. Yes. Mostly, right? A lot of that. And yeah. watching the Opry when it was on then. But the Opry would move around a lot too. My mm-hmm. grandma was a big, big country music fan. How did you learn about it and know that you wanted to come here? Well, my grandparents on my mom's side were professional country music musicians. They played in local bands around Montreal, where I was born, and they had pretty much quit by the time I came around. And but it was it, they were always had guitars laying around the house, so I got a lot of it from them. And they were listening to. My mom taught me guitar. She played. She liked kind of more in the folk scene. Um, but I became absolutely obsessed with it when the Barbara Mandrell show came on mm. and uh, I started to really do the deep dive and go into that rabbit hole and and then I discovered Ricky Skaggs I was in Heartache's record and Reba McIntyre and then I went and got into all the Patsy Cline and Loretta Lynn and the Judds oh geez the Judds I, I can't even tell you just obsessed with the Judds so I was really really into it and Crook and Chase used to have um, This Week in Country Music was a the show the TV show right yes the TV yeah, show I used to watch it too it aired at, oh, my gosh, you don't look old enough to remember that show. I'm 61. <laughs> You're aging very well. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Cricket Chase, uh, This Week in Country Music, you're familiar with. I'm, I'm grateful that you know what I'm talking about because a lot of people don't. But it aired um, it aired through the American affiliate in Medicine Hat, Alberta, where I grew up at like 2.30 in the morning. And I would set my alarm. And I was in school in junior high. And I'd set my alarm to wake me up. At 2.25, so I could watch the little black and white TV downstairs. I had a basement bedroom, and I would go sit by that little black and white TV and watch that show. Really? And then I'd go back to sleep. The days where I could just go back to sleep. I Same. I those days, right? I used to do that with David Letterman at midnight. I'd wake up, watch Letterman. Didn't even really get it. I was like eight, but I was like, that guy looks kind of awkward, and he's funny like me. <laughs> and if he can do it, I can do it. But I, I wouldn't really get it. Yeah. But I knew that that was kind of what I wanted to do. And then I would just go back to sleep. I think there's a thing that, like, in your brain, you wake yourself up to watch something that is helping shape who you're going to be and what you're going to do. And then you go back to sleep. I wonder if that just has some sort of, it sinks in like a sponge into your subconscious, like, in a different way. Doing something, I, I don't know. I've, I've never thought of it that way. But maybe we both kind of, it just, it got more ingrained or something. Did you, because I, when I finally met Crook and Chase, and I've now met him a few times, but I had him, and I did this with him for an hour, is really one of the coolest experiences. Oh, yeah. They're, they're great. It's great. And, you know, people that I looked up to when I was a kid, still today, those are the coolest people to meet. Mm-hmm. Because a lot of my peers now, they've made it and they're famous and they're rich. And, yeah, you know, and you start to see it's just a, it's just a game, mm-hmm. right? Like, you got to get lucky. You got to have a skill. We, you do something that's oddly celebrated. Like, you've been lucky enough to do something that's oddly celebrated by our culture when it probably should be like brain science, but instead it's, but, but this, like Mark Chestnut came into my studio one day and I was like, oh my God, or Crook and Chase were at my house. And I was like, this is the craziest thing ever. Like that to me was like a humongous deal to have them when you were finally able to meet them. I would imagine because that was your taste of American country music in such a way. Like, was that super cool? I still get goofy around people like Crook and Chase, Winona, Mm. uh, Reba, Ricky Skaggs, like all those. It, I don't know. It's just when you're forming. Yeah, you're maybe that's getting, it. You're forming. And- it's just they become part of your DNA almost. Mm-hmm. And, it, and so then it's, it's, it's like there's a reverence for those people that, that you don't necessarily have for the more modern day. Uh, and, and it's nothing to be old curmudgeonly about. It's sure. just it's, that's, your, that's your touchstone. That's your, that's your, it's more romantic then. It like, is. Like yeah. it, when I was 12. Things were larger than life, mm-hmm. and it, it motivated me to make big steps into what I wanted. Now it's like, I'll just use Luke as an example. Luke Bryan, 
okay, what do you, drop off a casserole? Who cares? <laughs> you know, I, I worked with Luke for like four years every day on Idol. You know, what are you talking about, Bobby? Yes, and he's like the best, <laughs> but it's like, that's, that, that's just my friend. Yeah. But like Crook and Chase, yeah. that, that was really one of those for me that when they came over and I was able to just spend an hour with them, but then I would tell them, I remember when you guys, you know, I did a lot of I remember when and didn't ask yeah. a question. Well, because you're a fan, like it's it's a it's and it helped shape who you became, and and everything that you are now and and that you've achieved is you have to find inspiration. There there are people that you're inspiring right now doing what you do that are Don't going to be do doing it. the same thing. Don't do it. <laughs> do not do this. Like Ralph Emery. I was going to ask you, have you met Ralph Emery? No, I've never met him. I watched him constantly. Yeah, though. me too. I love TNN, the Nashville network yeah. was, was also, I, I can see both of us like very, very influential and very integral in, in information gathering. Mm -hmm. Like it was. As a culture that I knew, I, I listen to the radio and I would hear, but until you could see it with your eye, you could see the people come on his show. Mm -hmm. You could see what Nashville, it was really the first it really made Nashville like three dimensional to me, and my again my grandma was such a country music fan that made me. But Ralph Emery was like the Letterman, but the Nashville totally Letterman. Yeah, and you know I find that when TNN went away, there was I got to actually do that show before it all went away. Uh, that's how old my career is at this point. But I got to do that show and. There was a span of time between TNN and when country became so hot now that the, it's a given. Everybody's getting the late night shows and everybody's getting the big network looks and all of that kind of stuff. Whereas there was a span of time where TNN wasn't there. Mm. And there was a span of time where country acts were kind of going into the abyss with as far as television and media and exposure goes. Because we were missing that element and that entity that TNN gave us back then. And it's only been, I think, you know, from in my mind, the last 10 years or so that country's become such a driving format. Sure. And, and everything that country acts are getting on all the stuff where it was such a hard sell for so long to get a David Letterman or to get the Tonight Show if you were a country act. And now everybody's on them. When you moved to town, did you take a job at first selling Western wear or did you start playing like Tootsies? Or like, what was the- I, I couldn't the, get a job. What was the order of, yeah. of how you made a living? Well, one needs a social security number and a green card to get a job. And True. I did not have either of those things or did, nor a car. But you um, have one though now, so we can air this, right? I do. Have okay, one just one making now, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I moved, I moved down and my mom, I have a little, I had a little brother who was five years old. My mom could only come down to help me get set up we had to find an apartment. We had to find a living situation. We had to find a cash paying job for me because I couldn't get work right. legally. So it was, uh, it, and then she had to leave. So it, it was a lot of uh, very fast, you know, and this is before the internet. I and mean, we were looking at classified ads in the newspaper to try and find a room for rent. Found a situation with this woman who was working uh, a shift at a factory she was separated from her husband at that time. There's more to that story. But I rented a room from her um, at, a, at a place in Tusculum, which is Bell Road and... I still use GPS here, so... Right, it, it, so it, it's, south, it, it's, it's Antioch, basically. So I rented a room from her in exchange for a break in the rent. I would look after her two-year-old son when she worked her, the, the graveyard shift at the factory. So I had a bus pass. My My... We found that situation, and then before my mom and Pat left, we got me a bus pass because I didn't have a car, so I had to take, you know, Nashville Transit. And we went to Tootsie's Orchid Lounge. We did a, we went to the Grand Ole Opry and saw the Opry, which was awesome, of course. We went to Tootsie's Orchid Lounge, did the Lower Broadway thing. Half of it was boarded up. There were people sleeping in the streets. It's before they made Nashville downtown uh, functioning again, right? Like insane. Even functioning. It was yeah. skid row. Yeah. And the cops were everywhere. There were hookers. There was drug deals going down. There was blood on the sidewalks. It was dangerous. And the only people who went into Tootsie's were usually the Greyhound buses full of the elderly folks that were on tours and stuff, and they would go in the who midday. Didn't know, who didn't know any better. Right. They, but they would, they would have a tour, you know. Yeah. This is Tootsie's Orchid Lounge, and there's the Ryman, and then they they breeze through there for 30 minutes and leave. But it was dangerous, and so my mom and Pat and I, I had to see it. We went down during the day, and, and we went in, and because I I was this country music historian. I was reading all the books, and I'd seen Tootsie's and Coal Miner's Daughter, you know, all the scenes mm -hmm. with, with everybody hanging out there. So we went in, and there was a guy singing, 
Of course, my mom and Pat are like, ask them if you can sing. And they're trying to get me up there to sing. The place is completely empty. It's a thousand degrees in there, which I'm not used to at all. I'm still not. And not large, by the way. For the people just listening, they don't know. It's very it, small. Yeah, it's yeah. tight. It's like a yeah. it's like a trailer, but a bar, like the size of that. Yeah. It's like a shotgun. Yeah. yeah. Doors open. Anyway, I get up and, and this, this guy's name was Bo. He let me take the guitar and he was glad to let someone take over his shift. So I started singing and... Slowly but surely, the place starts, you know, people start filtering in, and and all all of a sudden, it's full. And the owner, who was Robert at the time, who became Robert's Western World next door, he owned Tootsie's at that time, and he said to the music director who was starting his next shift, he said, see if you can hire her. So my mom and Pat and I are sitting there. there. From right there. Yeah. So they offered me a job playing for $15.15 a day, plus whatever tips I made. And all these little local yokel guys, you know, that were musicians trying to make it in town. And there was all of this, I'll make you a star, kid. It was just, mm-hmm. a, it was that kind was of it grimy? character, grimy, yeah. character, very, these characters that could have been in a movie somewhere. They're living in their cars and in the alley and telling me they're going to help me make it big. And one of them came up to my mom and said, uh, ma'am, whatever you do, don't let her play down here at night. You'll find her dead in the dumpster. Wow. Oh, God, you and tell now your mom's got to go back to right. Canada. Leave her teenage daughter. Exactly. What? So Pat, my mom's friend Pat, who drove us down, kind of convinced my mother that we needed to get me to Nashville because she had seen me and she's like, Terry, Terry's depressed. She needs to be following her. You've got her now. Let's take her now. Get on a plane. She did not speak to Pat all the way back to Nashville. Like it was a two day silent drive because she was scared absolutely shitless. Like, can I say that? You can say it. She was scared shitless, yeah. like terrified that something was going to happen. Um, so yeah, that's not what you want to hear. It was awkward. Yeah. So I promised her I would not play uh, lower Broadway at night. Can you, you imagine me standing at a bus stop and at midnight trying to get back to 10 miles down there? The bus, it took an hour and 20 minutes one way to get down to Tootsie's from where I was living. Cause it stops every sure. five seconds. Um, so I wasn't allowed to play down there at night. And there was an odd time that they asked me to take a night shift because somebody didn't show up. And I, I didn't tell her. <laughs> I said, I can only do this if somebody drives me and yeah. drops me off at home. Like, you have to come get me. So Did they? They did. Yeah, the bouncer would come get me. I can't remember his name. Very nice man. How long of shifts did you play? Uh, four hours. And I would take, you know, I would, I would take a break every hour for 10 minutes or something. Did you feel like that was such an integral part of your musical journey in that you had, you had to play four hours, yeah. even if it's covers? You know, you'd read about... I think the famous example is the Beatles when they were playing in like Hamburg, Germany, and they'd play for seven hours a night. And they were like, listen, all the things that we did, where we really became the artist that we are was having to grind out seven hours sure. because we're having to play covers. We're having to quickly learn. Yeah. Uh, how, doing that for four hours, did you just learn how to be a bit more improvisational? Yes, and because I was solo, like this is just me and a guitar. Right. This was, but Tootsie's didn't have a lot of bands back then. It was all solo artists. A, they didn't want to pay for a band, and it wasn't this big loud party scene that it is now. It was, it was a lot of tourists coming in, but you know, country didn't have the young college crowd like they did, like they do now. So it, it was, and the guy who let me sit in on his set, it was just his, him, him and his guitar. So. I would sit and I got, get a lot of requests for Patsy Cline and Loretta Lynn and whatever was hot on the radio at the time. And I was playing Tennessee Flat Top Box, the Roseanne Cash version, and Randy Travis. Um, this is this is before Alan Jackson or Garth or Clint or sure. any of that. So um, it was very much uh, the Judds and, and the early Reba stuff and classic country. Um, Did you kind of know what people were going to request? Like, Because even though they were different people, usually it was the same same group of songs. Right. And I had sat, you know, in, in my kitchen and in my bedroom in, in Alberta playing everybody's songs so much and learning so much. I was prepared. I had a plastic binder just full of lyrics and songs that, that I had been already singing. So I pretty much had a, a pretty good handle on it when I got that job. When did you start creating instead of per- playing and performing? Because you're here and now it's time to be your own. Mm-hmm. When, when did that start? I was uh, I was starting that back in Alberta. I was, really? you know, dabbling in songwriting. I mean, and of course, it doesn't have the creative community that Nashville does. So, I was writing by myself, and you know, essentially. So I was, um, I wrote a couple of decent songs when I was a teenager, and then when I got to to Nashville, 
I hooked up with a guy named Woody Bowles, who was a manager. He was one of the Judd's first managers with Ken Stilts, and he heard me sing, and he kind of directed me towards a couple of publishers that helped me put me with some co-writers and stuff and helped groom me as a songwriter a little bit. And I, and I wrote a few songs that were actually wound up on my first album for Mercury from, from that time. And I, uh, I had gotten married and I was able to actually, I got my green card and I was able to actually start working real jobs. And I worked at Applebee's over on, in, on, uh, at I-24 and, and, uh, whatever that road is over there. <laughs> I'm, I'm all turned around. Nashville's changed so much. I don't know where I am half the time. So I, got, I worked at Applebee's and bartended and had day jobs and worked at a boot store for a while. And, and he and I just kind of were trying to eke out a living. And I, was, I would go after my waitressing shift and I'd go down to Music Row in my car that was, I now had a car, blue smoke everywhere, but I had a car and, and go down and I would write until about 10 o'clock at night. So I'd go wait tables during the day and then I'd go down to Music Row and do some writing and co-writing and wouldn't get home sometimes till 10 or 11 o'clock. So you're, if you're playing anywhere, like you're doing covers or wherever you do your tootsies or, mm -hmm. so you're doing that, were you writing at the same time? Because mm -hmm. kind of, again, that's two, it's two versions yeah. of music, right? You're it having really to is. learn songs from other people so you can pay yeah. your rent if you don't get to watch the two-year-old or whatever, however old the kid is now, three or four. Um, but then at the same time, you have to go and then you, you have to write. Yeah. And again, different muscle. Yeah. They're very close to each yeah. other. But were you able to do that? Were you able to play and do a bunch of covers to make a living and then write at the same time? Or did you have to separate them a bit? Oh, absolutely. And because a lot of the covers and a lot of the artists I were covering were inspiring what I was writing because they were influencing sure. me in that music. And, and I kind of found my wheelhouse there and what kind of things I wanted to say and musically, r musical range and melodies that, that really resonated with me. I'm not saying, you know, we all copy a little bit from this and that, but I call it more like finding inspiration. So, uh, yeah, there were two minds, but I would throw some original stuff in the Tootsie set from, from time to time. Would they like you to do that, or were they like, just play the hits, kid? Well, they, they, would, they, they liked it because I would always also set it up and I wrote this song, you know, yeah. and I'm an 18-year-old drinking Diet Coke because I'm not supposed to be drinking and, you know... It's, it's, it was in it, it, a way that they, they also, I think, were enamored by this kid sitting down on Skid Row with a guitar. And, and I had a lot of protectors and people also, you know, kind of looking out for me um, that would sit down there. And this one guy, his name was Sir Lawrence was his nickname, and he's passed on recently. But he was this great big tattooed guy with an eight ball tattooed on the top of his head, and he looked like he would just rip you apart. He would. He came in one day and he was sitting at the bar and he was like one of very few people there and I'm singing right to him and he's just got. I started singing Patsy Cline and he just started bawling and tears are rolling down his face and he just became. He was a fan and he became a protector and he said, "I, I need to. You need to go and be singing at Gillies mm -hmm. up on Music Row. There was a Gillies up on Music Row where all the the statue of all the naked people are is right right there on that corner, and they had a beer garden and they had people singing for tips." in there. So he had me go meet the owner of that, the, the music guy of that place. So I went and played up there for a while too. My very first set playing. In the he made that room. introduction. He made that introduction. Wow. He used to drive me. He started taking me home so I wouldn't have to take the bus here and there because he had a car or a van that he was actually living in. He would drive me home in the van. Wow. I know. And uh, like, like awesome. And also, wow, at the same time. Oh yeah. Like, it, it was, I could, yeah. It, there were characters at Gillies, and they had an actual parking lot there. So a lot of their entertainers were also living in the parking lot in their cars and stuff. Elvis impersonators. <laughs> like, I'm not kidding you, Bobby. It's, it's, there's just one guy. Yeah, he, he, his name was Sonny, and he sounded exactly like Elvis, but swore that was his voice. This is me, oh, man. Oh, he this said is me, he man. Was, no, that wasn't an effect voice. That's how he really talked. No, he said he was trying to be Elvis. Yeah, but I'm saying he was like yeah. saying that that was really him. He was trying to mm. make like that was really him. And and so my first gig there at Gillies, I, I went to try it out. And they only paid me $7 a day. Uh, but they swore the tips would be better, which they were not. So you made half the money and the tips weren't as good. <laughs> but I just thought I'd try a different experience. Sure. And uh, my first day there, this this guy uh, comes in and I'm in the middle of a Patsy Cline song. And he drops dead of a heart attack right in the middle of me singing. Like just... Like physically you, physically could, you saw just, him go down. Yes, he just... And the, I just kept going. I didn't know what happened. I, I'm 18. I'm like, the show must go on, right? And... The song ends and the ambulances show up and I'm like, anytime anybody says, just go out there and kill them, I'm like, you should really shouldn't tell me that. 
actually happened one time. It's not funny, but uh, it, it was just the experiences during that time. You couldn't make you couldn't make this shit up that was going on, and the town was so different. There was a spaghetti deli upstairs uh, above a wax museum. You, it's weird to hear you talk about that. back in the day because you don't. You're like, and I hope this is a compliment to you. You're like legendary, but you're not old. It's like a weird. Thank you. You're like this this weird because <laughs> you're like back in the 1800s in Nashville, and it's like you can't. You don't even look old. You're. It's a. People admire you, and obviously with this duets project, you got to ask people to sing with you, and I'm sure people were just sprinting toward it because, you know, you're so revered in this community, but also you're not 100. It's crazy Thank to hear you. you talk about old Nashville, but it makes sense if you were 18. Right. Oh, yeah. Because you were you were doing that when times were completely different here, but you were you were a kid too. Yeah. That would be crazy I, for your I, mom. I go to Music Row now, and I stand there, and I look around, and I'm like, this just isn't even – if you were to take 18-year-old me and stick me down on Demumbrian right now and take the bag off my head and say, look around and tell me where you are, I, I wouldn't be able to tell you where I was. What do you like about 18-year-old you? Oh, the hunger, the passion, the create, the creative sponge that I was, the drive. And, and I still have that, but it's never the same as it is when you're just yeah. that, that determination that I, I want to, I just want to, just want a chance to show people what I can do. Why do you think you were so passionate about it? Who were you trying to, and maybe impress isn't the word, who were you trying to, to make proud? Was it yourself? Was it somebody back home? Like, who was it really for you? Question. Nobody's ever asked me that. Because <sighs> that hunger just doesn't come out of thin air, right? It doesn't. I, uh, I, I moved around a lot as a kid, and I had, a, I, I'd say, a, a challenging relationship with my stepfather, not a super close relationship with my biological father. I mean, we're fine and everything, but I, I had some... I had some tougher times growing up and I think um music was that one thing that mm -hmm. anchored me in a way and gave me that security and that confidence that I didn't have anywhere else and I became so obsessed with it and there was also a burning desire I'll, I'll show you kind of thing yeah no I've, I I don't know my real dad I met, I met him once a few years ago so I definitely understand that because that was a driver for me too mm -hmm. it was like wait I'll I'll show you why you really missed out on not being my dad. Like, that, that was a part of it for me, too. I think a lot of us have something driving us other than just a love for what we do that, that, that sparks that, that starts that fire. Yeah, I would agree. Um, the consistency, the, you know, you said music was just there. You know, whenever you have a really inconsistent life, childhood, like I did, like you did, mm -hmm. when you do have that one or two thing like my grandma was so consistent with me when she was with me. my grandma adopted me for a while too when you know my mom was gone I know my dad was but anything that had consistency like I still hold on to uh, like I'm the biggest Arkansas Razorback sports fan but it's because I knew every Saturday the, it didn't matter where I was living there was going to be a game and I could look forward to it it was going to be on free it's on free television so that was consistent for me uh there was music that was consistent for me because what, my life was not, there was no consistency about it at all. And so that why, it's why today I still like hold on to those things. It's even like the people we were talking about a minute ago that we felt like we're famous when we were kids. While we still yeah. feel like it's so cool. There's a comfort in the, in the consistency yeah. of something like that. And, and I said earlier um, in a, another situation, something that really kind of struck me because... You know, your career ebbs and flows and you have ups and downs and you have self-doubt. And, and even with success comes that, well, I'm not, I'm, I'm not the, the top of everybody's mind anymore. And, and you have to, you know, with that comes a little of that, you know, and you have to kind of navigate that emotionally. And it's not as easy as people would think it is. But, you know, 
and I think a lot of artists go through the, this period of, do I matter enough to keep doing this anymore? Oh, for sure. I deal you with know. relevancy issues. Relevancy, yes. Constantly. We could have a whole therapy Just session con- today. I live in, in relevancy land where yeah, it's like, me too. I'm not relevant anymore. This is Totally. I'm, yeah. 100%. How, how do you deal with that? I'll tell you how I deal with that. Um, this year, I, it kind of, it was, it was an epiphany that came to me and I started thinking back and I started going way back. And, to, and remembering that hunger, that kid that woke up to watch This Week in Country Music and sat for hours and hours in her bedroom singing and learning new songs, dreaming about Nashville, crying because she wanted to just be in Nashville, just wanted a shot, wanted to be on the radio so bad I could taste it. And I'm like, I can't give up on that kid. I would feel like I was betraying her if you know, I just did that. What's wild about you saying this is that me... Uh, 10,000 feet up looking at you and your career, I would see you and go, man, everybody loves her. Massive success. You would just think, but I think this is common, right? Like, around the room with whomever. I would just think that's the one person that doesn't deal with imposter syndrome or relevancy. And... <laughs> But it, it just shows you it almost doesn't matter. It's, it's like the screw loose that got us here is still the screw loose now that affects us in a slightly different way. And, and, we, and, and I think the danger zone um, to that is playing the comparison game too. Big time because you can never win. Because relevancy is only relevant compared to who's doing something sure. more. Yes. <laughs> like, and there's always going to be somebody doing something more, getting more opportunities than you're getting or – or being recognized more than you are. And, you know, sometimes you feel like you're spinning your wheels because you're working your ass off and you're just like, does anybody care? Right. Does anybody care at all? Will they ever care again? And then if, if, you, if you express that to somebody, they're like, they don't understand. Listen, how could you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's just, yeah, it's part of being human. It, it's that affliction, well, <laughs> the human affliction. And even as a creative, it's, you know, if I have friends that work, and most of my friends aren't creatives which I think is a big deal. It's good for me because they can kind of mm-hmm. give me a, a bit of a realistic view on what's really important in life. Mm-hmm. And, you know, with those, I can't really go, well, here's the thing. Here's why I'm, I'm upset. You know, this show, the stand-up show I did, you know, I did, I did announce a tour of 12 shows and it only sold 80%. And, I'm re- and they're like, are you, how is that upsetting to you? And I'm like, we don't understand. Like, last time I sold out every theater. Yeah. And now I'm starting. And so... At the, at the same, as trivial as it is, you'd still like to have someone that can relate to it and go, I get it, yeah. same, but, instead of just but. Yeah. You know, because uh, a lot of my friends are in the industry like, why are you whining? Your theaters are almost sold. And it's like, no, but you don't understand. Like, I deal yeah. big time with imposter syndrome. But when I do, I finally have a couple friends too now in the industry. Um, one of my closest friends is a guy named Ben Rector who... Ah! Do you, do you know who Ben is? Can I tell him this? Is he doing your Is he doing your project? Yeah. Um. He he'll be over in like thirty minutes. I mean, in like thirty. But but we can't really get into the project too much. Well, but I know it. I, I can't see it. pretend all, I don't don't all, know him. It's all embargoed. <laughs> it's so, all embargoed. <laughs> ben is one of my best friends. We work out here at the house three He's times a, a week. Genius. G- but is absolutely. And I think I get anxious. H- him. We have like an anxious three. We could be like a wrestling, me, Brett Eldridge, and <laughs> Ben Rector. I get, I can see you all being oh, friends. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we just call, like, if it's on like ticket, a release day or something, it's like, you, you doing all right, man? I don't know, man. I'm watching, it's, it's they go on selling six minutes. Don't watch, don't watch the live. Just check back in at, at night. Don't worry about yeah. it. But we all have, but to have those friends that could re- that can relate it's really important. Yes. And it's also important to have friends that can't relate at all. And there's yeah. got to be a balance. Like there my, has to be. My wife, not in the business. That is what, to me, helped the, hey, am I still relevant? Because she just doesn't care in the best way. And yeah. it drives me crazy sometimes, too. Because I'm like, don't you care if... And she's like, I know you care, so I care. But that's not that important. Like, you're doing what you love. It's going to be... Sometimes it's going to be great. Sometimes it's not going to be great. You're just going to keep going. And so that's very valuable too. Um, who is that for you? Oh gosh. I have, okay, so I have friends that I have had my entire life since I was 12. From home. 
Yeah, from yeah. home. And we're still very, very close. And then I have a few friends that I made in Nashville right after I moved here, like in 1990, who are also my other very best friends. None of them are in the business. The originals, too. Or originals. Been, yeah. I went to school with them. They are. They have businesses. They're school teachers. They're social workers. Um, yeah. Supportive. It's very important. And then and then I have the Pam Tillis, the Susie Bogus. The Peers. Reba and Trisha, like yeah. we all get together and we can we can kind of bounce these insecurities off of each other. We uh, more so me, I think. But I look to them, especially like uh, Reba and 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 Susie. I would say because I look to them like big sisters who have been through it all. And it doesn't matter how big the star is. Everybody has had their moments. I think where they've experienced something that they can go, hey, you, you know, and I can go. What did you do in this instance? Or like, like you got to have some of that too. But I, I think the balance is, I'm glad you have that too. I live you know, that. You have your history friends that yeah. have nothing to do with any of it. And then you have the people who have been there who can help, help you kind of navigate the complicated emotional waters that we live in. <laughs> yeah, or just like swim beside me, even if right. it's not navigate. Yeah, yeah. Because yep. there are times where Ben's like, ah! either and we're just like okay well we don't know together yeah. you know because yeah. it is uh it's a weird to get into a business where you are going to make a living creating something that you think is good enough for people to pay their money to watch because at the same time you could be the most humble person but if you don't have a bit of confidence even an ego about what and it is a weird juxtaposition of uh at times i have no confidence at all and at the same time, I'd have all the confidence in the world to create something, to do a stage show, to do a radio show, to do, and expect people to give me their time and money for what I'm creating. The most complicated part about it is it's all up here. Yeah. Like, and that sometimes will, will be the one factor that defines whether you go out there and kill it or don't, because it's all in your mind. You ever get it's all sad at seats that weren't sold? Oh, yeah, of course. I think everybody does. Yeah. And, and I got to tell you, every single night I walk out there, it's not a given in my brain that there's going to be anybody out there. Same, I swear yeah. to God, it's, it's that. Which is crazy for me to hear you say that, by the way. It's crazy for me to hear you say that. But it's, it's true. I'm not even saying it's not true, but it's crazy for me yeah. to hear that because, again, I see you, 10 o'clock. <laughs> I mean, that, that is, that's my perception of you. Can I get that you. 10 o'clock. <laughs> but, but in reality, you're Terry. Yeah, and I have all the same insecurities and, and and that anybody has. I find that hard to believe that you have that. I mean, I walked in and to your drove into your house today. I'm like, damn, Bobby Bones is Bobby Bones. Well, mine's <laughs> mine's like secret though, you know. <laughs> People don't know. Mine's well, like, they do now. Well, mine's like, <laughs> yeah. Well, they know from this, but it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we had again, we had to have something a little off for us to pursue a career in an industry where we want people to pay us for what we're creating with our minds. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean that that something off doesn't also like kick us at the same time. Do you feel like the confidence was greater when you were younger and you were going after it than it is after you've gotten it when you stop, when you start the questioning yourself constantly, because then you're, is there a shift that happens? I think I was naive. I think I was brave. I had nothing to lose. And I was naive because I didn't know good or bad. What, what was out there? Mm -hmm. I just knew I wanted it. And I knew I didn't want to be where I was, too. That was a big part of it, right? I, I didn't want to... Yeah. wasn't the greatest where I come from. And so I had big dreams. And, you know, if I had known everything, would I have still... I don't know. I think so, but I don't know. Yeah. It was simplified. Yeah. It was just... It was cooked down into this. Mm -hmm. And you didn't overthink anything. I just wanted to get out of that situation. I knew I, I could work harder than everybody else. I don't and didn't think I was the most talented, but I knew that I could probably strategize as good as anybody else. Mm -hmm. I had strategies strategy just to live yeah. for, for a lot of growing up. Um, but I do think that I, the, the more success I had, the higher my therapy bills got. Totally. Because I started really questioning, do I deserve it? What am I doing? My I have imposter syndrome like crazy. Yeah. Can I repeat? Then you're like, well, I don't want to not try as hard in fear of losing it. But then I start to question, well, why am I not going as hard? Because I'm, because I'm going to lose it? Well, then I will lose it. So, yeah, it's, a, it's that cycle. When am I getting thrown out of the club? When are they going to find out? For sure. I feel like I've been robbing 7-Elevens for 20 years. <laughs> and they haven't caught me yet. And I'm on the run. That's, that's, that's what it feels like. 
Oh, man. Well, I, 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 uh, it's, thank you for being so vulnerable. I didn't know that about you. I just always assumed that you were just... Look like a model, built like a bodybuilder. Yeah, yeah I get that a Brick lot. Shit house. Yeah, exactly. That's it. When did it's when did you not have to work service industry and you could just pay your bills by music? Oh my goodness. You don't really start making real money until about a year after your first hit. So, so, so I, I wasn't waiting tables. But, but a publishing deal? Mm, your first I had publish a publishing deal. Yeah, I got a publishing deal with uh, Sony Tree. Were you able to quit working in all the other jobs? Or is your publishing deal just like partial of what you were making? I made $350 a week from Sony Tree. And I was able to quit my waitressing job and focus on writing. That's such a big deal. That's such a big even if, like, you're making less yeah. money, it's still such a big yeah, deal. Yeah, it was a big deal, and I think that was, like, 1993. It was about a year and a half, two years before I got my record deal, and I was writing and writing and writing a lot. I was going down to the firehouse, the fire hall there on Music Row next to Sony, publishing and writing every single day. So how long until, from when you moved here till you got a publishing deal? Uh, about six years. Wow, really? Five, five to six years, yeah. Did, did you ever doubt two, three years into it that, that maybe, man, you had this dream, but crap, it may not work yeah. out? It took eight years to get the record deal, so I was writing songs for a couple of years before that, but during that whole time, yeah, I was, it was, I was all of, you know, 22, 23 going, well, if I don't get a record deal by the time I'm, I had this little deal I was making in my head. If I'm 28 right. and I don't have a deal yet, I'm going to go and become a dental hygienist because it's a trade and it's sensible and I'll make money sure. doing that. But I, I don't know if I ever truly believed that because you can't, it was just a little game I was playing with myself because I'm Canadian. We're very frugal and, and very conservative about things and Everything has to be very practical. Like, I can't just, you know, I've got to have some kind of a career if this other career doesn't pan out. And as a kid, I was going to go into law enforcement enforcement really? before, I, before I was going to come to Nashville and chase the dream. So I was starting to go back to that. Like what specifically? Like a cop or like yeah. a, really? RCMP. I don't, I don't know what that is. It's a Royal Canadian Mounted Police. I do like know what that is when you say federal that. Federal Police. Yeah, the ones on the... The Mounties. Horses, the, Mounties. Uh, the cartoons yeah. in the red. Yes, like <laughs> They ride the horses. Yeah, and they wear the red. <laughs> the cartoons, is that, yeah. Is that not it? Blame Canada. No, that's them. Okay. Yeah, that, yeah the Mounties. Yeah. Why, why law enforcement? Was there anyone in your family? No, I just wanted to, I wanted to make a difference in people's lives. I wanted to, I loved uniforms. I just, something, look what I wear. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I liked dressing up. So, uh, no, I wanted, I, I, and also I wasn't super academically gifted. I had to work really hard to get B's and C's in school. Because we moved so much. I was moving to different schools all the time. It was hard for me to cut a groove in a school and really, you know. Hard to get comfortable with people, much less. Hard to get making new friends and yeah. then losing friends. And uh, we, we just moved. And we moved back and forth across the country a couple times. And it, that part was difficult. But um, so academically, I think my grades suffered for that. And you have to have, you know, decent grades to get into university and college and and. and be able to do that and, and I knew I probably wasn't going to get there so I started and, and I was passionate about it I wanted to be a cop and I thought it would be a great career something I could do and retire and be able to retire at a decent age and have a good pension and all those sensible practical things very sensible yeah yeah so but that all went by the wayside after Barbara Mandrell came on TV I was like okay that was really the flash for you like you always loved it but until when you saw the Barbara Mandrell show or Barbara Mandrell herself that was what really told you, oh, I, I have to do this. It started It started the wheels turning. Yeah, that's how David the, Letterman was for me. Yeah, it started that that path. And then the deeper the mm. rabbit hole got, I was just I was just never coming out. And how many times did you watch Coal Miner's Daughter? I've probably seen Coal Miner's Daughter upwards of 50 times. Really? To the have point. you met Sissy Spacek? I've never. Oh, actually, I'm lying. I met Sissy Spacek at Mary Chapin Carpenter's wedding. That's a whole... Uh, I know, right? Uh, and Dave yeah. Matthews was there, too. Wow. I know. I just remembered that. I totally had forgotten about that. Yes, I did meet her. Boy, that was a surreal moment. Did you tell her I watched you 50 times in Coal Miner's Yes. Daughter? Yeah. Yeah, I did. I did. But I was still in shock because we almost died in a plane crash on the way to that wedding. We were stuck in... I flew with some people on this uh, puddle jumper with props, and Blake Chansey and I were, were, like, holding on to each other for dear life. It was bad weather. I'm just... Yeah, that was not a good flying experience. But it was a lovely wedding, and I got to meet Sissy Spacek. Did you meet Dave? 
I did in the parking lot, yeah. You see. Oh, Terry, nice to meet you. Oh, so much to see, Terry. <laughs> he was very nice. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He didn't crash into me, but he was yeah, very yeah. nice. <laughs> so I, I know we're, I'm, it's still, again, we're not talking about a lot of it, but because there's telling me it's a lot of this is embargoed, whatever the heck that is. We've already let the cat out of the well, bag and, a couple and, times and here. And we won't cat out of the whole yeah. bag, but again. They're, they're giving, they're grimming me. The PR people are going, you're a bad girl. No. I, <laughs> you're, this is what I'll say then. And I, I'll also cut this if you'd like. When I mentioned earlier that people really look to you as inspiration, I think this unnamed project that may be happening is an example of that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I do, because that wouldn't happen or you wouldn't get yeses or you wouldn't get – it just wouldn't happen if that wasn't the case. I – that all is wonderful to hear. Thank you. Do you believe it though when I say I it? I don't know that I ever I know, believe it. I know. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It's that, that – could, could you logically though – could you pull, pull yourself out of you and if – let's say it were me and I was like, hey, I'm doing this comedy, uh, big comedy special and – I've got like this person who said he's going to do it with me and this, and she said she's going to do it. Could you see that they're only doing it because they find some value in doing it with me because they like what I do? Mm -hmm. Could you see that if it were me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's all. Definitely. So that's what I see with this. I'm not even saying what it is. Right. But and I hope we can actually come back and talk about for sure. that more. Yeah. Because this is, I love talking to you. I'm saying things I've never said to anybody. Like, I'm, what's with the vulnerability today? Oh, my gosh. Well, it's like Vegas. It's you, retrospective. You know how they pump oxygen in? Right. We have Xanax there. <laughs> and it kind of takes you down a little bit. Can I and move makes in? you loose. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so you, six years until your publishing deal, and then a couple years after that until you got your record deal. Mm -hmm. Did you ever get into the mindset of, I'm just going to be a writer? Because a lot of my friends start to think that. They're like, you know what? The artist thing's not going to work, but I have gotten pretty good at writing songs. And then later, their artist career does happen. But for a bit, they go, I think maybe I just write. Did you ever just settle? Maybe I'll just be a writer. Or did you keep grinding toward no, that? No, I really wanted to be an artist. I really wanted to sing for people and perform. And and I, I it wasn't as much about being a star as it was about connecting and performing for and, and delivering these songs I was writing. Why'd you like to perform? It's a connection and, and it's a it's an approval. It's an approval an instant approval rating. Yes. Um and it's it, I, that goes back to that I think that wanting to be loved and liked. It's exactly what mine is. Oh, that's self It's love. Stuff. It was me trying to find love. Mm -hmm. Even being funny as a kid. Yeah. It was me trying to find love in a way in a place that I couldn't. Yeah. In a safe place. And it, people are if you're good, they're not going to throw eggs at you, you're going to find that love. And I knew I was good enough for that. Um, but I just, yeah, just being a writer was never, it wasn't, I wasn't as passionate about writing as I am about performing. Writing for me has always been a vehicle to performing. I needed the songs to sure. go make the records to be able to go out and perform. And I've always been a very project oriented songwriter. It's, I'm not somebody who just writes all the time. Do you have a mentor here? A Did mentor. you? Like a, when you moved to town that you could just call on your landline? Mm. My mom was my mentor, I got to say. You know, she was she was my biggest champion. She was my inspiration. She, I was closer to her than any human being. Is your mom still alive? No, she passed away. How I, long ago? 13 years ago. She was 60, and she died of a very, very rare form of cancer. Oh, that sucks. just killed me. And that, thank you, uh, that, that changed. I had to really sit down and take stock and, like, what would my mom want me to do? Because I felt like I'd kind of lost half of half of this team that we were up until that point. You mean after she had passed, you had yeah, to kind of read, like, take, take, yeah. Like, do I, and I just went right back into doing what I do. I'm like, I, I, I'm honoring her by doing what we, what we, we both sacrificed. She let her 18 year old kid go to Nashville. Like the sleepless nights that woman must have had. And, oh man. But, you know, she didn't say you have to come home. I would call her, you know, collect. I'd call her a lot, and uh, one time I got off at the wrong bus stop on my way back from Tootsie's, and it was blazing heat in the summer, and I was, you know, head to toe in cowgirl clothes and boots and standing there holding a guitar at the, the Hardee's at Harding Place and, and Nolansville Road. And 
I got off at the wrong stop and I kept waving the buses that would come by down. They wouldn't stop. They wouldn't, there wasn't their stop. There wasn't that. Finally, one stopped. And I said, I don't know where I am. And I was sweating and I'd, I was in tears. And he finally said, you have to wait three more buses and then this bus will come by, you know, and this, he's just opening the door and looking at me and I'm standing there with a guitar. And I got home from that and I, I said, I called her and I said, I don't know if I can do this. I was just absolutely hysterical and in tears. And she said, you can come home anytime you want to come home. But I just want you to think about when you're 50 years old and you remember coming home and not taking this shot, I want you to be okay with that decision. And I didn't go home. I was like, she had to, she was devil's ad. She never told me I couldn't come home, but she, she also knew how badly I wanted it. And that when it, a moment might have just been an emotional temporary thing. Which was a very selfless thing for her because mm -hmm. you know she'd have loved to have had you home. Yeah. Like that would have been the best Absolutely. thing in the whole world for you to be at home. Yet, she still said, mm -hmm. hey, think about this. Because she knew what you wanted. You wanted to stay in Nashville. Yeah. And she didn't say, you should stay. She said, think of, I mean, yeah, it sounds awesome. What was your mom like? Oh, she was, my mom was uh, very focused. When she made up her mind about something, she would just do it. Like very focused, very determined, very strong, but also very kind and very sweet. Um, supportive, encouraging. She was my very biggest cheerleader, and and when she died, there was there was it was, you know, I went right back to work pretty quick, and I think I needed to because I don't. It was either I'm gonna I'm gonna keep I'm gonna keep pushing, and I'm just gonna do what I do, or I'm just gonna I, I may never get up again. So I just kept pushing through. Do you feel my, when my mom died? Because my mom was forty six or forty seven when oh, she died. So sorry. That's oh yeah. Horrible. That's so, horrible. but it's but. You know, I also can sit here and talk with you about it from yeah. a place of empathy more than sympathy, which I would rather talk from a place of mm -hmm. understanding, right? Because mm -hmm. we get to uh, relate. And But I probably jumped back in way too quick. I don't think I allowed myself to mourn at all. Mm -hmm. And then I think over like the next five to seven years, it kind of trickled out in weird ways. Just like something would trigger it. Did your mom get sick or did she die suddenly and unexpectedly? My mom was a drug addict and she died... Mm -hmm just from years and years of, like, meth and substance abuse. Did you have any idea it was going to take her life? Um, she had been in and out of rehab a bunch. But, I mean, I never thought she would die. But she wasn't super healthy. Mm. I mean, she had me, she got pregnant at 15. So it wasn't, like, the easiest life for her. So I don't know that I was shocked. But, yeah, I was surprised because it wasn't that she was super sick. I right. think it was just yeah. a oh. partial, like, probably too much at that time. Like, it... You know, and then partially her body just not being able to hold on. But I, I remember I was working. I was on the air, and I got a call from my sister. She, nobody ever calls me during the show because they know I'm pretty locked in and focused. And she was like, Mom's died. And I was like, wait, what? She said, yeah, Mom died. And I said, okay, let me call you back. And I just finished the show because I didn't know what to do. So I stayed for like two hours and just finished the show. And didn't, I told Amy, who's my co-host still to yeah. this day, those are all my same people 20 years ago. Wow. And I was like, hey, I'm going to keep going. But my mom died. And, and I remember Amy crying the whole time. And me, I, I didn't. Because wow. I, 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 the only thing I knew was to push. You I was, compartmentalized. For sure. Had to learn as a kid even. So it wasn't because I was strong or cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, if anything, I kind of wish I could have felt. But, you know, went did the funeral arrangement, went right back to work. And then it was, I could feel it like the next seven or eight years probably just trickling out of me where I wish I had taken a little time to mourn wholly. Mm -hmm. Where I don't know, I don't know, I don't know looking back that I made the right decision doing that. You, you how, how quickly until you went back to work? My mom died in April and I was back at work in June. And my brother who works on oil rigs, he's an oil oil guy. He he's younger. He was only he was so young when she passed away. He was only 27 and he went to Brazil to work on an oil rig and and he he actually um he processed more than any of us. He really mourned and he he had a very hard time with it. But my process was, you know, 
I mourned. We had things to arrange. Things had to, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm a distraction no, no, queen. Like I just did the same thing. Yeah. Then went back to work mm -hmm. and, and then, you know, and then I'm moving again and then I'm renovating another house. Then I'm making another album and then I'm back on the road again. Then I'm writing songs for this next album. And then I got to put that. It's been like, you know, I'm, I'm still wondering if I'm just going to absolutely fall apart one day because I yeah. just stayed so, I just, you know, you keep pushing and stay so distracted, you know, with whatever it is, relationships or moving or projects. And, you know, do you ever, and I'm like, well, what does that, what does that look like if I just sit and go, I have to be sad about mom and just lose my shit here for, you know, yeah. God knows how long. And I did mourn, but some, some of my friends who've known me my whole life and my mom and knew my mom were like, we were actually thinking that this was going to take you down. Like, big time for a long time and and they've told me that they were actually surprised or I, I guess I don't know what the word is surprised that it didn't as much as I thought it would but she was also very sick for three years and mm. battling this thing were you in Canada a lot while she was sick yeah yeah I spent a lot of time flying back and forth and I actually I had bought a house near my parents that had had bought a house on Vancouver Island so that they could retire there and because it's a, just a beautiful place to be. And I bought a place just to be near them yeah. when they were growing old because I love my mom so much. And, you know, so I, I had a place there and I was able to be there quite a bit, took quite a bit of time to go back and forth and, and be with her. But, yeah. My favorite so. part of this, my favorite story here is you being at that bus stop, calling your mom, your mom would have loved to have had you home. But she loved you more than she would have loved having you home. Yeah. And she made you go, okay, think about this. It just would have been so easy for her to go, yeah, you need to come home. Because believe me, she, it was, yeah. That would have been awesome for her to have her daughter home. Right. Who she loves more than anything in the whole world. Yeah. Yet she still was selfless enough to yeah. say, I don't think, in her own way, I don't think you should come home. Right. To not want me to have she made any you get big the, regrets. She made, she made you get there yourself. Yeah. And you did. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. She yeah, was, your mom sounds was. awesome. Yeah, and, and there's been so many things that have happened that she should be there for. My brother got married. I burst into tears that night. I've had my moments. I had one the other day. Carly Simon album comes on, and I'm chopping onions, and it's not because of the onions. I'm just bawling, and I'm like, oh, I just have, you know, just moments where it just comes out of nowhere. Small, odd triggers still get me, too. Mm -hmm. Like the random Home Depot commercial. Yeah, and a I'm song like, on the radio. Like, it's... yeah. Canada is, to me, the nicest place in the whole world. And I, so I, I'm on like 30 or something radio stations up there. And if I go, everybody's so nice that it feels like they're going to murder me. <laughs> uh, I'm, not, I'm not kidding. I, I was scared. Uh, the first time that I went to, into, even Toronto, which is a massive city. Oh, there are a lot of not nice people in Toronto, oh, Bobby. Trust I hear me. you. That's why, Have you been to the airport? That's why. I, well, they held Mike at, uh, yeah, in the airport. For a few hours. They held him for a few hours. Um, but I think there was another Mike with his name that was like a killer a or something. Murderer. Yeah. That, but we, that people were so kind that I was scared they were like setting me up for something. And I think that's just the nature. I'm suspicious of your kindness. Of, yeah, <laughs> of Canadians. Um, where you grew up, though, that was like West, that was like West um, United States, yes. right? Like above, like yes, above Montana. So I was born in Montreal, which is kind of like above New York, mm -hmm. um, and then moved to Alberta, which was above well, Montana, yeah. and then moved back to above New York, and then moved back to Alberta. Um, it, it, we zigzagged across the country a couple of times when I was younger, but I spent the majority of my formative years, I guess, from 10, nine, nine years old to 18 in Alberta, in Calgary and, and Medicine Hat. Medicine Hat's a cool name for a town. It is, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I have a, a lot of friends and even family that are, that live near Native Americans and, and my wife's from Oklahoma and so she's, um, partially Native American, too. And her, some of her friends back home have the coolest names, like Medicine Hat, John, John Medicine Hat. Oh, all the towns up there. I mean, there's Moose Jaw, there's Medicine Hat, there's Pincher Creek, there's there's all kinds of Fort This and Fort That and Prince The town that Regina makes me laugh out loud. Well, you know what? The city that rhymes with fun, they I call know. it. But and, it's, and, and I told people, never end. I told people that's what was on a sign there and nobody believed me. Well, I, I don't know that I can even tell some of these stories on the air because I'm sure Regina gets so mad about it because it's it's just like, it's 
I pl- every time I play there, my band's American, my crew, everybody. I, it's the <laughs> jokes leading up and leaving. I'm just like, okay, we got to get off this train. It's just, come on. But for how many how many Regina jokes do you guys have in you? you uh, <laughs> it never ends. See that itself. It's just funny, right? Many, I know. <laughs> how many do I have in me? <laughs> do you fly in and out of there very often? I know. Yeah, <laughs> no. It's, see, ends. I'm not even going to do it because I, it's, it sounds pervy when I do it. When you do it, it it's funny. It does sound pervy. Yeah. But, um, so, okay, t- 20 years at the Opry? Yeah, and that's that, crazy. That's, that's awesome. It is. It is awesome. And it's, it's so funny because uh, Trisha Yearwood's celebrating 25 years this mm-hmm. year. Pam Tillis is celebrating 25 this year, and I'm celebrating 20 and like we're all Opry members and we're all friends and it's just it's bizarre that I get to have friends that are Opry members <laughs> and that I'm celebrating an anniversary I get to be an Opry 20 member 20 years as a member of the Opry that's so cool I can't even did I can't you, even believe I am an Opry member did you Talk know it was coming imposter. did you know they were gonna invite you uh-uh no I had no idea I had no idea and my and they had my mom had just been in Nashville she would come down and stay for a month my nieces were here and we you know all the visit family and and she would come stay for usually a month, and then she would fly home. And she had just done her months, but she does once a year. And she'd been she'd flown home. And two weeks later, I'm standing on the stage, and she comes walking out with this sign. And I just turned around and went, "What are you doing here?" Wow, your mom. They flew her. That's and she didn't say anything about it. Mm-mm. Her and Steve Warner came out with the sign that had the date that they were going to induct oh, me on God. it. Oh my God, that is awesome. So something. Big was happening and I was in shock I think it was just I just can't I can't even believe I get to play the Opry let alone be a member and walk on the stage I get so nervous Bobby every time I swear to God but and, not really you don't oh I do no you have no idea it, it it has another level of nerves for me and I don't know if it's because the audience is usually very quiet especially that audience during COVID when you were hosting and we were up on stage and nobody was in no the audience. audience. That was a very quiet yeah, audience. That was extremely, that was, that was tough. A lot of people disguised as seats there. Wow. That's so cool that you're, they flew your mom down and her and Steve Warner came out. Yeah. They were hiding her in a, in a broom closet backstage because they didn't want me to see her before she walked out. So she said, I could hear you walking up and down the oh, hallway man. and talking and I couldn't come out and say, and I, they were telling me to just stay in this, this janitor's closet at the Opry. That's so cool. And they must have obviously known how much she meant to you. Oh, of course. Which is why they yeah. made the big deal. My mom was around a lot of that stuff. And she even acted as like a little bit of a personal assistant for me for a while. And every manager I hired back then, I made sure they met my mom because I wanted to get... She was a good judge of character. She had a good intuition about people and trustworthiness. And I think my current manager even had to meet her. Poor Clarence. <laughs> I never say poor Clarence for the record. Poor Clarence. Never. You know Clarence? I do. Yes. Okay. So, uh, tell, so what are you going to do on the road? Are you doing, are you doing sh- a bunch a of bunch shows? A bunch of shows this year, yeah. It's, I, I took last summer off. I toured with Reba McIntyre last year, which was fantastic. What did you think about her great. national anthem? Oh, she killed it. Yeah. She kept it true. I think the national anthem should, unless you're Whitney Houston, you know, and can actually land on the mat every note you hit. Like, But Reba just did, she did it the way she would do it, mm-hmm. not trying to be somebody else yeah, doing it. you're right. And so she nailed it. And, and the poise and confidence under pressure. Is, she's always had that. I want half the confidence she has. Does she have it though, or does she make us think she has it? Because she is awesome. Well, I I wonder if she goes home and is. She's a great actress too, but I I mean I I when she said when when <laughs> when she said she told me she was going to get to do the national anthem two weeks before they announced it because I was at a at a chili cook off at her house and I said oh my god I would just piss my pants and she said. Me too. And I'm like, you will not. <laughs> she was just so, she's just like, are you just trying to make me feel about, better about my lack of confidence by saying that? But she got up there. It was just like, it was just amazing seeing how the grace under pressure that like we all hold ourselves to the Dolly and Reba gold standard. I don't know the situations they've, I mean, Dolly, that, that thing, the cheerleader thing. I mean, my God, mm-hmm. that's just, that's confidence. I want just, I want to bottle just a, a hair of it. And you toured with Reba, and so you did a bunch of those shows. Yeah, I did a bunch. uh, Like, I think we did 30. Mm -hmm. And then I took the summer off um, and then just planned on working really hard in 2024 and with some things going on and around that. So we have a very busy year coming up, and this is probably going to be one of my best and biggest touring years since the 90s. And 90s country is so hot right now, too, and I think that – that plays into some of it too. And just the, the fact that I think more younger people want to see us, you know, they want us to play our hits and they're, 
the artists that are hot right now that are talking about their influences. <laughs> this makes me feel our, our, the 90s our act, you know. They're calling it the new classic format, which is like, doesn't seem that long ago to me, but I guess it was. You know me either, but I guess it was. It was. You know, same, except pays, you know, 90s pay awesome now. I mean, if you're 90s, like, you can buy shoes, you clothes, can... anything from the 90s. Artists, hip-hop, Creed, although that's yeah. 2000. Like, like, all the stuff where we were broke, like, now all of our people have money and they get to pay and actually come and watch us now, which is cool because they can actually not ask their mom for money. Well, exactly. It's, and, and, and bring their kids. The generation, yeah, the generational thing is really cool. You see, um, I see people in meet and greets with their, with their kids and grandkids if they were, mm-hmm. you know, you know, of a certain age at that time. And it's just, uh, you know, the, and, and then the 18 year old girls singing every word to better things to do in the front row, wearing their mom's vintage t-shirt that they got at the George Strait show I opened in 1996. It's just like, yeah, this came from my mom. She was going to throw it out. And I'm looking, I tore the shit out of it. And it's cool now. <laughs> I, I put some bedazzles on it. They tie it and they put, well, let they me decorate it. finish with, I'm going to ask you about Toby to kind of wrap this up. Oh man. Um, you, you know, with Toby a bunch too. Like what, give me a Toby story memory. Well, it's not just one memory. I mean, uh, I toured with him and he, he kind of, I kind of looked at him like a big brother you know, we talked a lot. He gave a lot of advice. Um, he was always very honest, brutally honest, and told the truth. I would ask him questions that I, I think some people were like, wow, I can't believe she just asked him that question. And we would, after the after the shows, you know, go to his bus. And I would just get to be a part of, like, a Toby Keith bus party. Everybody's, the bus is bouncing up and down. Brian O'Connell's on there DJing from his computer. And I'm just like, I felt like I was just, got to be in the cool kids club and um toby played basketball with the crew and the bands every single day uh and i i have a radio show and i interviewed him for this radio show um you act like i don't know that by the way well i don't you know massive, what you're gonna... i know what you're <laughs> and by the way when you win all the when you win the awards i'm like all right whatever and then, then it makes me feel lesser than. But oh, yeah, I'm not winning awards. No. I'm I'm winning only women. I, I I won a Gracie award. You don't qualify for that because you're a boy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and congratulations on all your awards, by the way. You've got a lot of them. I'm still saying I can still get a CMA award as a radio host. I never got one as an artist, and it was my childhood dream to get a CMA award. So I'm like, man, if Bobby Bones would just you know retire. Well, they ever. Well, I, oh, please God, I can't retire. I don't. I'm not going to retire. I have, I have no worth if I'm not doing this. That, that's that's funny. But, uh, but yeah, but back to Toby. He was he was great. We would always like dip together. Back then, I was I would dip school. Oh. And I'd, I know I'd walk on the bus and he'd <laughs> he'd hand me a, a solo cup with a napkin in it that's and hilarious. and he'd borrow one from me and my I'd borrow one from him and just stand there talking just about everything. And I remember getting really hammered with Dean Dillon on his bus mm-hmm. and I don't even remember getting back to my bus and. Toby said, I watched you walk back to your bus to make sure you were all right. How are you feeling today? <laughs> and then I, you know, he just like always so cool, so respectful. And when I, I remember one thing he said when he was doing press for that tour and they said, well, Terry Clark's here coming out as your opening act. And he said, he said, Terry Clark's one of the most underrated artists out there. And that to me, just like, he's not, he's not somebody to just throw stuff out there like that. Cause he's so honest. It meant the world to me that, that he said that yeah um and then uh I, I interviewed him for the radio show and i think this was right before he got diagnosed with cancer or right around the time because it was it was right around two years ago a little over two years ago and the first thing he said was you know i'm all you know getting ready to interview and i'm like okay okay toby you ready ready he goes you want a dip oh. <laughs> <laughs> and i'm like did you hear me That's you want funny. a dip um but it no it, it was just <laughs> He's just always great. We talked a bit after the interview and he said, call me, we'll go to lunch because I was frustrated with creative stuff. And, you know, I'm like, I, I don't, I, I could really stand to talk to you right now and get your advice on a few things. And he has, he had a record label and stuff. And he said, call me, we'll go to lunch. And the whole COVID thing was going, it was just, yeah, I, I didn't get to get to, I, I wish I'd have gotten to get together with him one more time, you know, but it's a tremendous loss. I think he is, has, he was one of the greatest songwriters of all time in country music and a great entertainer, a great guy, and, and didn't 
bother him to disagree with you and didn't care if he he didn't care if you agreed or disagreed. He just said what he felt. What a day. Well, we talked about a lot. Yeah. We covered a lot. No, of yeah, a lot about you. But I'm just saying you have such cool stuff coming up. It's, like you said, it's going to be a big year for it's gonna you. Be, well, it's going to be fun. It's going to be something uh, new and not new. Nostalgic with a new flair. And I think that it's going to be fun. Well, when we can announce it, let's let's do something again. I would love to. Awesome. I'm, a big, fan, I'm a big fan of yours. I'm a big fan of yours, too. Um, it's, it's super- I appreciate what you do because I know it's not always easy. And you do. You, you're, I, congratulations on all your success. You've, Thanks. You've... You deserve it. You're, you're like a, you're an, you're a mogul. I am consistent. <laughs> you're I comfort- show up comfortably consistent. I show up. <laughs> I mean, like I tell my guys, just show up and be pretty good all the time, and occasionally be great because you can't be great all the time. No. But if you're just consistent, yeah, like that's what I try to do. It, consistency is key. Absolutely. You got it. Um, on Instagram, Terry Clark Music. On TikTok, at Terry Clark. You have a, you have a big TikTok following. I do. Yeah. <laughs> You do. <laughs> I guess I do. Well, that's awesome. You know, I, I have I have some social media people that help me with. Hey, that. whatever. They're, they're very good. Whatever. Yep. That's awesome. Thank you very yeah. much. Well, it's been a real treat. Uh, we did over an hour, so I don't want to keep you any longer. But it's been this has been really fun for me. And then when we can talk about the cool stuff, let's talk about the cool stuff. All right. We talked about us, both of us. Yes. But when we it was a about, great free therapy session. How about this? We talk that. backward a lot. We'll talk, let's talk forward next time. Okay, we'll do that. All right, Terry. Thanks, good to Bobby. see you. Yeah. Good to see you.